Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. Um, this is uh, another exciting episode, one I'm extremely happy for because we're going to be talking fish today with marine scientist Hillary Jaffe. Um, Hillary's been following Coffee with the Critters for a while. Hillary? I don't know. Okay. We'll find out from her how long when I bring her on here in just a couple of minutes. So um, for those of you that are new, good morning, everybody. Hey, Carl, good to see you. Yes. For those of you that may be joining us this morning or watching this replay and are new to Coffee with the Critters, uh, we live stream every Sunday morning from the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page at 9 a.m. Eastern, unless otherwise noted with special guests, special time. So next week is another special episode at a different time. Um, if you're not familiar with the work that we do here, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We are an international educational center teaching people all over the world through our live streaming services <clears throat> how to empower animals in the people that care for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, if you're not familiar with the work that we do here at the Animal Behavior Center, I am very passionate about empowering animals, um, sharing that education through our live streams. Um, you can find out about more about what we do on our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. <clears throat> theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. We have a brand new website. Uh, it's still up and moving and running, and you're getting ready to see a lot of things happening. Okay, so for anybody that wants to contact me directly, I answer all my emails. Um, myself, and you can reach us through our website uh, on the contact form or my email address is Laura, L-A-R-A, at the Animal Behavior Center com. Let's see, what else do I need to say before moving on? Good morning, everybody. Hey, Donna, Carol, Jeannie, Lori, Jennifer, Sandy, Colleen, Jim over there in the UK, Shelly, Cheryl, Kelly, Kellyanne, Mary, Tim. <laughs> Um, let's go ahead and uh, let me mention just a couple things before we bring Hillary on. Um, and that is, if you want to find out the work that we do, um, our events on our Facebook page, take a look at our events page. We keep it updated weekly and it's pretty active. Um, you can find out where I'm speaking or um, what events we're attending, uh, presenting at. Um, or our live streaming services, um, the schedule of our live streaming services through our level one, level two membership, through our projects, right there on our Facebook page. Um, also on our Facebook page, if you want to join our email newsletter list, which is very popular, um, I pour, put a lot of time into our email news newsletters, and I might work on our next one this afternoon because I have nothing else to do. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, okay, and I had some excellent conversations yesterday. Those of you that know Dr. Jason Crean, um, biologist, nutritionist, an amazing man with an amazing mind, he will be here at the Animal Behavior Center next Saturday with a special guest. We will be live streaming um, our next episode. And when we do them in the evenings, we call them Cocktails with Critters. Um, Jason, Dr. Jason Crean and a guest will be here next Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern. We will be live streaming um, and we're going to do that here on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page. So special note for next week. All right. Without further ado, let me bring our special guest, Hillary Jaffe, um, on. She's coming on in three, two, one. Hello, Hillary. How are you? Pretty good. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good, good. Um, it's nice to have you on Coffee with Critters. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> so when we talked the other day, you had mentioned you'd, you've been watching Coffee with the Critters, um, but yeah. due to your work schedule recently, you have a little bit of a conflict. Yep. Yeah, yes. I have... Um, I've got a mini pig, so I used to watch the videos for ideas on like helping to train the mini pig and a great informational video. So I'm very honored to be on it as a guest today. Good, good, great. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Hillary. You are a marine scientist, and I have some photos I need to show. So um, 
as I put them up there, if you want to talk about what they are. Um, how did you get into this field? Um, so it wasn't a very definitive like career path. Um, growing up as a kid, I always loved playing outdoors. We had ponds and creek in our backyard, and I would like be out like playing, trying to catch the crawdads when I was little. And then when it was time to go to college, I was like, well, you know, this this school, Coastal Carolina, offers in-state tuition to go get a marine science degree. So, you know, let me give it a go. I think I'm going to love it. I've always loved going to the beach on vacation, and it just I kind of fell head over heels in love with the ocean and here I am now. Um, it's kind of, it's not been, like I said, a straight path. Um, as you can see in the picture, that's me with uh, one of my puffers at work. I'm actually training that puffer, but you know, when I went to school, most of my research was with restoration projects. So I did a lot of stuff with oysters on the coast and aquariums at the time were just a hobby. So um, it kind of, progressed from like a little teeny tiny puffer fish that I'm just like, oh, he's got so much personality. Wow, I never knew that like fish were this smart. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but- um, No, it he, does not. He just sparked my interest and like watching him and how he behaved, it was so cool. And you know, one aquarium became two, became three, became eight. <laughs> so, I know how that goes. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's addicting. So now I've, I've only got two, two now. Nope, I've only got three now. <laughs> um, so if you see behind me, actually, this is my cowfish, Frank, swimming I around. Love cowfish. I love, <laughs> I'm obsessed with cowfish. It, he's such a ham. He really is. So um, we used to have a puffer fish here. Uh, volunteer Sandy Pratt brought it in. We had a, a tank here where we. Um, we have two fish here right now. One is Delilah, um, but kind of like you, I mean, you and I both know they're so unique and intelligent. They are a product of their environment. Um, I, I know when people ask me, what is your favorite animal to train? I know I get excited when I train the fish. And I love showing people, people get excited coming here and training the fish because they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know this was possible. Right? Yeah. Yeah. People, fish are so much smarter than people give them credit for. Like they really, really are. And like, it's amazing. Like, so I work at a public aquarium and we occasionally do tours behind the scenes and the big puffer that was in the picture. So like if the tour comes through during feeding time, they will, they're like, hey, do you want to show them, like, we'll do tricks. And so this, <laughs> this puffer is, like, it blows people's mind. They're like, what? He's just like a dog. I'm like, yeah, he's, they're very smart. Yeah. I've got him trained. Um, he knows, he's got a couple different targets now. I first started out as just, like, a pack, picture of Pac-Man on, like, a sign with a PVC stick. And he knew that when the little Pac-Man sign was in the water, he went and, like, smacked it. He got food. And it's progressed from that to like a, um, it's almost like one of those really hard rubber dog toys. So he, again, he knows if he goes and bites a toy that um, he's going to get food. And like, I, it's gotten to the point where I can point at the toy and he'll go and swim across the tank and get the toy. And uh, I was practicing yesterday, like having him swim through hoops. So I'm every day, like I get just as excited watching and seeing how he learns. It's, it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. And, and you see how I'm pretty sure I could say this, that you love your fish. Oh yeah. <laughs> if and, something happened to my fish, it would be a very, very bad day for me. Yeah. Um, I can see that. And you forwarded to me a couple of videos, which I can't show here, but what I'm going to do is after coffee with the critters, I'm going to take those videos and upload them to this episode. Um, so that target, this is a different fish, and I don't know, I was just watching one of your videos before this. Is this the target? Yes. So that's that was the original target, and it was funny because, so before, right now that big puffer is in our, in the back, in the quarantine system, so I can work on one-on-one -on -one training versus him being in this giant, massive tank and all of these other fish in there. So this photo that you've got up now is when he was in the big tank, and it's crazy how the other fish have learned, like learned that behavior. And this this little guy in the photo is a different species of puffer, but he also picked up really fast. 
And there's even other species of fish, not like tangs. So they're surgeon fish. Um, and they, they came to realize as soon as they saw that sign, they needed to be where that sign was because there's going to be food associated with that sign. Conditioned reinforcers. So they've learned that cue and they learned that, Hillary, they've learned that through watching each other. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Like at first it was just one or two fish. And like I said, at first it was just like the three puffer fish. They realized like, oh, hey. And there's another porcupine puffer that I, I don't think I sent you a picture of him, but he's so funny. Like he knows if he sits up at the step where the divers get in that one, like at least one time out of the day, he's going to get food. <laughs> so he's very, he, he's, he's kind of spoiled, but. <laughs> spoiled fish. Yeah. Um, I know like one of the reasons I have fish here, I like to back up the work that awesome people like yourself do um, and showing people how this can be done through numerous species of animals. And I like to take, what I like to do is take animals that people don't think can, obviously everything works. If they're alive, they, they're learning. Um, I like to take animals that people wouldn't think possible are to, to, to interact with on this mm -hmm. training platform yeah. relationship. Um, that's why we brought in turkey vulture, um, fish, the opossum, um, a, a wide a variety of different animals we have here. And we open people's eyes like this is how the science of behavior works across species. Um, so you have a couple of different photos I don't know if we'll get through them all, but if you want to start talking, is, is there one in particular? Can I bring this one up? Because when I saw this video this morning, um, this is exactly how we trained our fish to swim through a hoop by touching a target. You know which yes. one I'm going to show. Yes. <laughs> this one. Um, I'm, I have, I'm so proud of this puffer. Like, He's my baby. But again, so I mentioned that we had that dog toy, right? And originally it started out as a sign. Um, it was a laminated sign, actually. And the reason I upgraded to a dog toy is because, like, he's so, he's big. He's, like, he's maybe two feet long. He's he's a big boy. But, it, like, as far as puffers go. And, like, he would go up and he would bite the sign. And it was laminated, but they have such a strong bite that it, like, destroyed my sign. Like, I was making new signs once a week. So I <laughs> traded up for these this dog toy that it, it's safe in the water. It's good. It doesn't break down. And um, was putting that little pink dog toy in front of the hoop. And even though the hoop is kind of narrow, he knows every time he sees that toy, if he goes over and touches it, he's going to get food. So like you can see this like little ring. It's actually like pool noodles. But um, but because it's weighted as it goes down in the water, it kind of shrinks up in size. But he's still like it amazes me. He just he swims through it every single time. Yeah. When uh, we train our fish here, one of the first things we did, um, one of the first things I did, is they were very fearful even approaching the side of the pond. So they would scatter. Um, so I had to shape that behavior of just showing the top of my head, boom, throwing food, showing the top of my head. And then I slowly got closer and closer. But with working with prey, um, a lot of prey animals don't like like hands and objects over top of their head. I saw that would uh, cause them to scatter. So um, one of the first things we did was teach them to touch a target stick. Um, we had to train ace to station, I mean go to an area and do not move until I cue you to do otherwise because what was happening is we had five fish and the other fish would do the behavior. They would touch the target, and then Ace would swim up and grab their food. So <laughs> if they weren't getting the reinforcer, we knew that behavior of touching the target was going to decrease. Um, so we had to teach them all to stay in their stations. Um, and mm -hmm. when the target stick came to you, that was your cue for you to touch it. And then we would reinforce the bridge was the movement of our hands. We would bridge uh -huh. and um, reinforce all the other ones for staying. And then I know okay. Sandy and I were talking. I was just like, we need to teach these fish to swim through a hoop. So Sandy made a hoop out of like some pool tubing, um, some like aquarium tubing. And then 
we dropped the the hoop through the water and then they already knew how to touch the target so we dropped the target kind of like what you were doing here on the other yeah. side of the hoop and then we could slowly fade out the target and then the cue to swim through the hoop because it was paired with the target in the food the cue to swim through the hoop became just the sign the, the visual of the hoop going into the water that's so that's that's really interesting when you talk about like, the different pieces like people have asked me like how you do it and you're right you don't like it's not just one quick thing like oh he goes through the hoop now this is <laughs> this has been a long time in the works so, yeah you're right like get him to come to the top the sign getting him puffers really i don't know they're such personable fish like they're not so much afraid of you like a lot of times they'll just come up and like like i said the little porcupine one he's such a busybody he'll be in your face like hey what's going on you got some food for me i'm here hi Can I <laughs> But, um, yeah, it's it's those step by step and adding on to it, like one little bit at a time and taking what they know and a lot of patience, too. A lot, I can't tell. Yesterday I was trying to, like, teach him to go, like, putting the hoop on the other side of the tank and, like, pointing at the hoop so he knew to swim through it. Oh, man. <laughs> There's a lot of I'm not going to, like, I'm not giving, giving him any other signs. I know he knows what I'm asking and patiently waiting for him to go. Like, he would go and, like, swim over and just kind of hover next to it and kind of put his nose through it and then look back at me like, I'm ready. Did I do it? No, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you train – what's the name of your puffer? Um, I usually just call him Puff. Okay. Original. He's, yeah. <laughs> it depends. Some of the other people – so there's a whole team of us that work there. So that's just kind of my nickname for him. I know some people had, like, the spot fin puffers like him that are really big. I guess they had one once that uh, bit somebody's ear, so they always called them Tyson, which I'm like, no, no, he's not mean. He's, he might bite you if he's hungry. But um, so I just I just call him Puff. <laughs> I almost spit out my coffee. <laughs> okay, and then this is Frank, correct? Yeah. Yep, that's baby Frank. You can let's see if I can... Uh, Everybody. So Frank, he, he used to have really long horns. So cowfish have these two big horns that kind of stick up out the top of their head. And uh, when he was a baby, they were giant on him. And the past year, so their horns are, um, they can regrow them, but sometimes in the wild, or if you have aggressive tank mates, or if you try and steal your tank mates food and they bite you, you can lose part of your horn. So Frank's horn now, instead of it being like straight, kind of got this nice little crook in it because he has chased people's food. <laughs> and uh, tried, like, I used to have a giant hermit crab in the tank with him and like, he's tried to steal the hermit crab's food enough that the hermit crab has pinched him. And so now, that's his little. <laughs> so now he's got a unicorn? Is he getting a unicorn? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Frank is behind you, correct? Yes, Frank is, you, he's, he's a ham. I think he knows, like, so I've got a, a light on here to better illuminate things. And I think when he sees the light, I think he knows if he, like, hangs out over here, eventually he's going to get fed or, like, yeah, I don't know. I, there's one time I'm just sitting in front of the tank playing on my phone and, uh, like, what is that? And sure enough, he's, like, right behind me spitting water that's going through the, the canopy of the tank and getting me wet. I'm like, that's impressive, dude. That's yeah. really impressive. Yeah, I would reinforce the heck out of that. Uh, see, that's a problem. I did at first, and now, <laughs> anytime we come into the room, he's just spitting water everywhere. Like, he's he's ruined several LED light strips because, like, when we're in the kitchen, he's just spitting water. He's going crazy. He's just <laughs> so I haven't figured out how to retrain the water spitting. Can so. you put the water spitting on cue um, or teach him? Okay, so you hear me say a lot, in order to change a behavior, you need to replace it with another. Could you teach him to do something else instead and then put that on a continuous schedule of reinforcement, but you're going to have to go over and reinforce every single time in the beginning, um, yeah. and then extinguish the shooting the water? Um I could. 
I would just yeah. like I would have to I got I would have to figure out what that is. Yeah. A lot I I don't have a animal behavior background, so a lot of like these things that I'm doing it's like ideas that I've picked up like from videos like yours are just like, oh, I see them I, I'm seeing this fish do this thing. I wonder if I can like I, I've seen him do it multiple times. Yeah, well, you know what? Let's chat. I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to work with you to come up with another behavior, and then we could bring you on here again and show you how. Oh, what happened to Hillary? <laughs> um, let me message her real quick and say, can you click on the link and join? Yeah. Okay, we'll get Hillary back in here. Um, so I have several photos of Hillary. Um, how did I find Hillary? I think she messaged me. Hillary has a uh, uh, big Instagram account. So I think she's very active on Instagram. Um, and I joined, I think it was about a week ago, I attended one of her live streams. And you can, you can follow her on Instagram. I have a bunch of links. Uh, I follow her. Her name is Waterlogged. Um, she has an Instagram account. She has a Facebook account. Um, and I do have those. Hang on. She's messaging me. Okay. She's coming back in. Um, I do have, while we wait for her, I'll, her um, website is waterloggedlife.com. And there you will find information about her uh, Obviously, her love, her love for the marine life. She has. You can follow her on Facebook. I do as well. Um, there's her Facebook account, and here is her Instagram account, Waterlog13. Let me see what's going on behind the scenes. So let me tell you a little bit more about Hillary <laughs> as we can get her back in here. So I have several different photos of her, um, none that I can talk about. I don't see you, Hillary. She says she's here. Hang on. Let me tell her to exit and come back in again. Can you exit and come back in? because I don't see you, Hillary. Oh, there she is. She is here. Bring her, okay. I was just talking about you, showing how people can follow you. Um, okay, so where were we? Um, oh, I was gonna say, let's get in touch. If you're interested, I'll help you come up with a behavior modification plan so you don't have to spend so, many, so much money replacing lights all the time. Yes, that would be awesome. Yeah, okay, because it sounds like now maybe he doesn't understand. It could be an extinction burst um, where he has learned this has earned him reinforcement in the past. Why is it not happening? And then if you go mm -hmm. over and reinforce that once in a while, and even if, if with your attention, he's thinking, okay, now I have to spit water 50 times to get her to come to the tank. Yeah. So I'd be happy to work with you on that. That would be awesome. I'd appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Yay. All right. So what other photos do you want to talk about where, um, like I have like this photo? Oh, okay. So, um, <laughs> so science is not always glamorous, but I always have a ton of fun doing field work. Um, I, a lot of when I was in college, a lot of my work I mentioned was with oyster restoration. And so this was, you know, just because it's cold out doesn't mean that nature isn't doing its thing and doesn't shouldn't be observed. So um, this was bundled up going to do some sampling out in the salt marsh. And uh, I got to say, you know, right now I live in the middle of the desert, but I miss the salt marsh every day. And if anybody on here has ever like lived in a coastal region, has experienced the salt marshes, 
They're kind of smelly, but man, all of the cool stuff that they can hold. It's so where was this particular salt marsh? Um, this was in Myrtle, like North Myrtle Beach in South okay. Carolina. Okay. So the school that I went to was Coastal Carolina. It, it was in Myrtle Beach, um, like 30 minutes from the ocean. So it was a pretty good place to go and study uh, all sorts of ocean life. A lot, like I said, a lot of what I did was oysters. So I found them intertidally, which is really cool. So during the tide, like when the tide is out or it's a low tide, there's so much neat stuff that's exposed when the low tide. So oysters are one of those organisms. They do a lot of really good things when it comes to water filtration. So um, we worked uh, building oyster castles, oyster beds um, for them to help promote water quality in the area and stabilize shorelines. Like with, when boats come in, all the waves from the wake will erode the shoreline slowly. So building the oyster reefs and those castles along coastlines helped to reduce that erosion and improve water quality and provide habitats for fish and stuff. So interesting. So things people aren't even thinking about. Not even a little bit. And yeah. actually one of the things, you know, if you one of those if I have time sort of thing and have space and money, I would love to set up a, an aquarium with oysters and just like over feed that sucker like nobody's business and show people how much oysters can filter. So like a single oyster, like maybe like that much, can filter, um, I believe like 50 gallons of water a day. Really? So that's, that. I mean, for a small little guy like this, like that's, think a, lot. Much oysters, that's a lot of water filtration. So that, you know, yeah, I, I do work in aquariums, but I'm very big into educating and inspiring people through education. So like if I were to be able to show people stuff like that, then maybe that would inspire them to like build more of these living shorelines with these oyster reefs on them. And, you know, well, little facts like that, that you're telling me about, I, I didn't know those are things. Uh, well, like I say, when we know better, we do better. Exactly. Um, so yeah, little facts like that. Do Where would people find, where do people go to find these facts and follow you? I mean, I know I posted some links, but you post this on. <laughs> so every day I try and post something new and exciting. Some days, you know, there's not always the exciting stuff coming in, but every day on Waterlogged. So that's my Instagram and my Facebook page. Um, there we go. Waterlogged 1313 is Instagram. And there's a similar, the exact same thing is going to be up on Facebook. So you can follow there every day. I post something new and I do respond to all of the comments and questions. And, you know, if there's stuff that people want to know occasionally, like I'll get, usually it's just family members. They'll send me like, Oh, Hey, I saw this news article. What is this? Like, can you, can you tell me more about this? So, you know, if I don't know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know, but I'm going to go do some research and I'll, I'll come back to you in a couple of days and let you know what I found out. So. So you're probably, are you most active on Instagram? Yes. Okay. And that's where I follow your account. Um, yep. And that's where I was able to join your live stream last week. Exactly. And I was like, hey, Hillary's on. I'm going to jump in here. <laughs> um, so your web, this is your website and you have a blog yep. on there as well. So people can follow that. Yeah. So the blog it's not updated off like super frequently, but you know, for those research articles that do come out that I just think are absolutely fascinating. Um, and I want to expand upon it and share more than just like two or three sentences. Um, that's the blog is where I'll put that, but the blog is, or the website is also um, a good place for, you know, not everyone has Instagram and Facebook, but uh, YouTube is definitely a free place that people can go and watch videos. So um, I've tried to expand across platforms, like for my parents who aren't always, you know, on, I don't think they're on Facebook, but you know, I want to make it accessible for everyone. Yeah. And if you follow the daily posts, I do try and keep it really simple. Like, n like fourth grade level, like it's easy. If you, if I put it in simple terms, anybody can understand it. You don't have to be a scientist to understand science. Yeah. Oh, I love that. You don't have to be a scientist to understand science. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, what's this picture? So, um, you know, a lot of people that have marine science degrees are 
like, I feel like it's just a shoe in for them being a scuba diver. But for 10 years, I avoided getting my dive certification. But when I got this job that I have now at the public aquarium, um, I was required to get my dive certification because we dive in our tank every, almost every single day. So you have to be dive certified for safety. And this was uh, my first dive certification, um, like in the lake day. It's crazy. It was super, super cold. <laughs> Uh, maybe like 42 degrees in the water and 40 degrees out of the water, which maybe for you guys isn't that cold, but uh, it's usually pretty hot here. So 40 degrees was very chilly. Okay. So this photo is taken in Nevada. Yep. So this is uh, at Lake Mead, super chilly and cold, but so much fun. Yeah. So um, <laughs> Frank Reese is going to be so bummed that you made it on here before him. Frank Reese is with Blue Zoo. He's a, fascinated with fish and he wanted to be my first person to come on here with a fish and you beat him. Um, so um, Beth asked a question that I actually wanted to ask you. Have you ever seen or worked with an octopus? Oh, great question. So I have not seen an octopus in the wild, but actually just this week on Halloween, we got a new shipment of animals at work, and one of them is a little teeny tiny octopus. Oh. So maybe he's a little bit bigger than golf ball size. He's still super small. Um, he's it's you when we turn the lights out, I can usually see him come out and hang out, but he's still pretty shy. I'm very excited though. He's actually eating. Um, we had an octopus before that like never came out and never ate. So I'm very excited now that this guy is out and eating because they're super, super smart. Um, yeah. I, if you, I think it's Monterey Bay Aquarium. Maybe there's one public aquarium that like has given their octopus GoPros and the cool things that you can do with octopuses is like, it just blows my mind. So hopefully once our little guy gets used to being with us, we can start doing some of those fun trainings. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you know, but I'm majorly obsessed with octopus. <laughs> Have you heard of Octonation? No. So it is, I believe, the largest online octopus fan club. Um, one of my buddies, uh, Warren Carlisle, is the founder of that. And he's, he's a huge octopus nerd, like, lives, breathes. He went to school for, like, fashion design. And now, like, I think running this fan club is his life. So very informative, very educational place to check out. Okay. So what is that on Facebook? What is that? Where is this? Yeah, I believe it's on Facebook and Instagram. I think like Octo Nation. Okay. If you type it, it should pop right up. I may already follow it. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, when you start working with this octopus, um Will you tag me in any live streams? I'd love to jump. If I see that, man, I'll be dropping everything I'm doing and jumping on and watching. I, I can do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I've wanted to get an octopus here for a long time. Um, I belong to Tone Mo, the online octopus, well, not just octopus, uh, magazine. I've done a lot of research. Um, I really want to work with one, and I really want to show people. I just think they're amazing. Um, but I really want to show people respect this creature. Yes. And I usually do that through working with one. Yep. Oh, you should definitely get an octopus. That would be cool. I had somebody who, who was flying in to um, look at the center and design a tank, um, but it fell through. That was a couple years ago. So I would really rather have the octopus in the house with me so I could interact with it a lot more. That would, there was a um, – I haven't seen it yet. There's a PBS documentary that came out maybe a month ago with – I think the octopus's name is Heidi. So I don't – have you seen that? No, but I got tagged in it quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. So, I like, it, it was her date, like, the, the guy's day-to-day -day life. I think he's a professor, but, like, watching how they interact and, like, what she, do, what she did throughout the day. And, like, I believe they, they think that she, octopus will actually dream based on like the color that her, um, like the patterns that her skin was changing when she was asleep. So. Yeah. Just, yeah. I'll have to watch that. Um, but let, okay. Oh, so <laughs> this, this is actually a photo from my backyard, one of the creeks in my backyard growing up. So this is literally when I was a little kid, we didn't have any neighbors. I, we lived out in the middle of nowhere. So this is where I spent my summers playing and, 
exploring and, you know, I, always looking for like the crawdads and like the toads and the frogs and the snakes that were outside. So that's, I feel like that's where a lot of my passion for nature in general kind of stemmed from is, you know, growing up and having that freedom to explore the outside yeah. world. I was reading on your website about how you used to go to the creek in the backyard and yep. um, turn over a rock and there was a crayfish and you grabbed some water and kept running the water out to the crayfish. <laughs> that was cute. Yeah. Um, really cool things now. I'm like, oh man, I probably killed all those crayfish. But in a little bit, like, oh, they need water. I have to save them. Yeah, but they were your um, your intro to the work that you're doing. Yeah, um, they were like in the springtime, we would go out and collect the tadpoles and try and raise them to frogs, which I don't, I think they got legs, but I don't think any of them ever made it to the frog stage. It, we would always end up going on vacation. And it's funny, as you're talking, there's a lot of similarities in our childhood. I know um, I used to live in Michigan as a kid, and I, um, I remember, and mom tells me the stories of the kiddie pool. I would always go get the kiddie pool and fill it up, and I would go collect <laughs> I probably killed a lot of beetles, but I collect beetles and throw them in there because I like to watch them swim. I would go find um, salamanders underneath <laughs> rocks and put them in there. Uh, that was like back when I was six, seven years old. I remember that. And I remember as we continued to move, I would always be turning over something, um, watching the turtles in the lake. Uh, I was a big fan of salamanders. Um, and mom never knew what she was going to find in my bedroom when she walked in. <laughs> um, okay, what do we have here? Oh, so um, I didn't always work with saltwater animals. This was the teeniest, tiniest baby catfish you'll probably ever see. So it's kind of hard to tell because the colors really aren't there. But fish, especially when they're larval, they don't at all look like their adult selves. This one has more of a body shape, but again, it doesn't have the coloring. So when I first moved out west, I actually worked for the Department of Wildlife as a fisheries biologist. Um, not anything that I ever thought I would do. So a lot of what I did was the sport going out and um, looking at populations of sport fish. So largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, striped bass, um, and we did a lot of work with the local anglers. And I got to say, they blew me away. Like, I never anticipated to, like, meet such a passionate group of guys and ladies um, that, you know, yes, they were out fishing. But they you know, like, you know, did you guys put in any new habitats there? Like, how are populations doing, you know, the spring? Did, is there a larger amount of, you know, shad than, you know, there were, like, tell us. And they, they were always curious and they wanted to know about stuff and they wanted to know, you know, oh, hey, we saw so-and-so so dumping, you know, did you guys go take care of that? So it's, it was kind of cool because I got to see a whole different side of fish, that freshwater, you know, sport fishing side. And I was amazed at how passionate that they were. But yeah, this is one of the, the photo is one of the little baby catfish from the samplings that we used to do to study the populations out on the lake. Okay. Does that lead into this next photo? Yep. So um, we did education and outreach also when I worked for the state. And uh, so this was at the fair, but we used this as stuff fish to show some of the tagging. So when we would go out into the field and we like set our nets, I think, I think I might've sent you a photo of setting the nets. So we'd set yeah. these giant pull nets. It up? Sure. Let's see. Maybe. Oh, it was the next one. I should have just left it up there. So um, we would build this habitat and stuff. So it's kind of hard to see, but there's these big structures and we would take um, like cut down branches of like invasive species that, you know, we didn't really want them up on the shore and we'd stick them in the uh, like big PVC cubes and then we'd take them out into the lake and drop them. So we're creating habitats for fish and then Later in the year, we would go out and drop these nets and sample um, and see what what kind of numbers of different fish were working. So that photo of the fish on the board, we would tag certain species of fish so that the next go around when they were sampling, like 
we could say, oh, hey, we caught this fish. And you could look back in the records and say, hey, when we caught this fish, it was January 15th, 2016. And, um, you know, it was this, it weighed this much, it was this long. Well, now it's, you know, November 3rd, 2019. It's this big, this long. So we can study how populations grow. Um, kind of hard to tell, but like on the top center of the fish between those two fins is one of those tags that we used to use. It's on there? Yeah. So it's uh, in the fit between the fins on the top. There's yeah. like little teeny tiny little things sticking out. The tags aren't very big. Okay. Okay. It's a little bit plastic, but. So you're catching fish kind of like how we, um, I used to volunteer at Black Swamp Bird Observatory and we used to um, capture, we used to net a lot of birds um, during migration season, um, weigh them, check out their fat content, measure the wingspan, ban them, and release them. Yep. Yep. So then when they migrate again, we catch them in the net, we can see by the band where they've come from or if we've had them before. And we, it was primarily warblers. Boy, was that just that was an awesome experience. I loved it, loved it, and I had to stop when I opened up the center because my time was, I had no more time. Yeah. Um, okay. And it was really cool because um, I think we caught some uh, warbler that was like seven years prior, um, wow. traveled to and from Venezuela. What? Yeah, many That's times. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's so it lived that long. It was pretty cool. Um. So one of these, you know what, Hillary, I have family in Vegas ah. and I'm usually out there one to two times a year. That's when you told me where you were. I was like, what? I always, I always pictured you like at um, Monterey Bay Aquarium. That's where I pictured mm. you. So maybe one of these times I come out to Vegas, I can hook up with you for lunch. Yeah, or, that's a lot of fun. yeah, we'll talk some fish. All right. Um, so then, let's see, what is the next picture? Uh, well, we got a couple more pictures to get through. I sent a lot of pictures. Oh, so when I was talking about when we set the nets, so the nets are relatively long. You can see where the shore is. So we would start at the shore and kind of pull the net all the way out. And you, you set those in the evening, and then you come back first thing in the morning and go through those nets and see what you've caught uh, that tells you, you know, in this this cove of the lake, you're looking at like X number of stripers, X number of largemouth bass, you know, this many carp. So it, it was a it was a hard job. Like doing the field work is hard. It's a lot of work. It's gross. You smell like fish. But uh, it's probably one of my favorite parts of my career. I love doing field work. It's it's not always the best conditions. Sometimes it's freezing cold. And you're camping out and like. 32 degree weather, but it's, it's so rewarding. It's so much fun. <laughs> it's funny how we go out and get these, uh, get our education to live in the freezing temps camp, <laughs> uh -huh. get muddy, dirty, yep. but that's the fun of it. Um, all right. And I know this is a picture. Um, this is actually a snapshot I took from one of your videos. Yep. This is our little dog face puffer at work. And, you know, I know a lot of what you talk is like re giving them a new different behavior for the behaviors that are undesirable. And this little guy, <laughs> I think I'm probably the only one at work that likes him because he will come up and bite the divers all the time. But if you when you go down and feed. So um, we have sharks and stingrays in our tank. And so when I go and like do the feed show, um, I always take this little sign with me because it's still around. So I'll take it with me and um, like take a couple pieces of food just for this fish. Because if you give him his target and like you give him his little opportunity, he, he knows if he goes there and hits the sign, he's going to get the food. And because I'm down there, I'm kind of going to don't say protect him, but kind of put my arms out so that none of the other fish will steal the food. But I noticed that when you do that for him, during the day, like he doesn't come up and bother the divers. He doesn't go try and bite people during the show. Like if you give him his own little set thing, he's good. He's, he's such a well-behaved, cute little pudgy potato fish. So I got a couple of thoughts about that. Um, I wonder if he's doing it because 
he's intermittently reinforced, so divers probably want him to stay away from him. So do they go in and feed to get him to go somewhere else and leave them alone? Um, no, because okay. they're, they're, they're terrified. I don't want to say they're terrified of him because he's a little tiny fish, but um, <laughs> when, when he, he's got a nice little beak on him. Um, when they do the dive show, they've got a container of food. It's not a sealed container. So a lot of times he'll hang out right near the food container. And when the diver will move their arm up this way to feed the stingray, he'll swoop in and steal food out of the container. So he knows where he needs to be. So I think that's like, he comes around just for the food. But again, if you give him his own separate thing that he doesn't have to play the other fish for. Do they do that? I think I'm the only one that does it. Okay. Because I was thinking like some kind of foraging ball just for him. Something where it's not just free food and he can hurry up and fill up, but something like I'm thinking, I'm just thinking, I don't know, either a netted ball or like a golf. No, that probably wouldn't be safe. But um, something where the food is dispensed slowly. So as he has to sit there and kind of push it and move it around, food Mm -hmm. comes off of it once in a while. Yeah, I was actually thinking, and I've got to find a good recipe and something that will work in our system, but using, um, I've heard other aquarists talk about making dental blocks. So I, I think it's some sort of plaster, but you put the food in it. So it also helps as he goes after it, it will help him like to file his teeth down and to keep mm-hmm. his teeth in like check, as opposed to us having to pull him out of the water and like trimming his beak because it's so long, he can barely get food. Yeah. Um, you know, sitting here talking to you, that's cool. You, uh, the dental block made me think of, um, I used to work with uh, several different people, but there was this one veterinarian. He's the former Toledo Zoo vet, Dr. Dr. Timothy Reichert, um, an amazing man. What an amazing man. Um, he's done, he's seen our animals here. But one of the times I worked with him, we worked together on several different animals from primates to wolves to, believe it or not, a puffer fish. <laughs> and I was in charge. We were in the um, surgery room, but the puffer fish, I don't remember what was going on with the puffer fish. But um, somebody brought it in. There was something wrong with it. And my job, which scared the crap out of me, there was like four of us in there were. It, assisting him while he was working with this puffer puffer fish. My job was telling them the amount of time um, they would put the puffer fish in the water. Um, This has been a couple years ago. So they had some kind of anesthesia in the water and they would pull him out and work on him for so many. And I, that would be like, that would be like, go. And I'd sit there and I can't remember if it was 30 seconds or 40 seconds. I don't even, re- or 15 seconds. I can't remember what it was, but I was so nervous because I was like, cause I'm sitting here watching the clock and kind of trying to watch and see what they were doing. I was like, Oh, stop. <laughs> Put them back in the water. <laughs> but that was one of the coolest experiences of my life. Yeah. Those, I, yeah, we occasionally have to do that. I'm, oh, it makes me so nervous every time. Yeah. Well, um, would it be possible for me to hook up with you sometime when I'm out in Vegas? Absolutely. Maybe, maybe maybe live stream live stream. Huh? Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. We could live stream from both of our pages and the, it'd just be cool to meet you and actually see the work that you're doing. That I'd be so excited to share that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I do plan on getting to Vegas sometime within the next year. I'm sure I'm going to be out there a couple of times. Sounds good. So, Hillary, we, we are through all of the photos. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say as we come up on the hour for this um, live stream? Uh. <laughs> well, there's, I mean, something that you've said, like even your facts about the oyster. I'm going to start following you. I'm going to start following you. Um, because I like those little tidbits of facts of information. And maybe... If you see some kind of opportunity, like, man, people need to know more about this. Let's get you back on here with Coffee with Critters. Okay. Yeah, that'd be really cool. There's, uh, I, uh, this is going to sound, and I hate to, like, say this, because even as a, that's okay. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> Alarm clock's going off. Um, so, 
like plastic pollution and stuff. I know I feel like it's been beaten over the head, but um, like raising, yes, plastic pollution is an is issue. Um, but I like to try and raise a little bit of awareness, like what, you know, little changes that you can do at home. Like, you know, how many of us go out to eat in a weekend, right? How many of us take home like doggy bags and to-go containers? You know, I, I go to breakfast at this place where every single time I know I'm going to have leftover food. So just making like thoughtful choices. Hey, I'm, I know I'm going to have leftovers. I've got a giant purse. So I just bring like a little Tupperware container with me. That way, you know, it's one less thing I've got to throw away at home, one less piece of trash, it's just stuff like that, that, you know, when you hear about like plastic pollution and like trash and waste and stuff, it's, it's kind of like a disconnected thought, but um, just it's knowing that stuff that we do has consequences and yeah. 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 Um, I know something I do instead of getting upset when somebody serves me a drink with a plastic straw in it. I, that is my, first of all, I'm like, you don't know me very well because you stuck that plastic <laughs> straw in my drink. But what I do is that is my cue to say, Hey, excuse me and inform them about the straw or, um, who's the manager of this restaurant? Who owns this restaurant? Can I talk to them and just say, Hey, have you ever thought about, you know, these are educational opportunities where restaurants choose to start doing that. Now you can be proud of yourself to say that, yes, we're taking part in trying to make the change. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that straw thing. So for the longest time I was doing the waterlogged page and it's just like, it, it was a way for me to kind of like express myself and like share all these cool things that I you know, thought were really fascinating. And I didn't really think anybody paid attention to it. And I was after a hike, we went out for breakfast or something and they come out with like drinks for our group and they have straws in them. And one of the girls sitting next to me goes, oh, my God, Hillary, what should we do? It's got a straw in it. And I was like, what? This was before like the straw ban was it fully enforced. And it just like it blew me away because I'm like, oh, man, people actually read what I write. This is this is so cool. Like. People are listening, like, maybe I'm making a difference. You are so. making a difference. You are making a difference, um, <clears throat> which is why I invited you to come on here because I've been watching your work, and I was like, this girl has really got a passion for this. <clears throat> Let's bring her on, um, at least expose you to the audience of the Animal Behavior Center um, and see where it goes from there. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this has been such an honor. Yeah, and it's 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 an honor to have you on here. Somebody's even made a comment um, about how you they can tell <clears throat> you really love what you do because when you start oh, talking about the fish and the field work, you get a huge smile on your face. <laughs> I, I I really do. I you know I I tell people I'm like you know I'm like as a marine biologist I don't make a ton of money, but there's something to be said for loving what you do and going to work every single day, even if I don't make big. The fact that I love what I do. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm happy going to work every single day. And that counts for so much more. Yes, it does. Um, somebody asked me the other day, <clears throat> what's your favorite hobby? And I was like, oh. I was just like, when I have any downtime, I like to work. Because <laughs> I love what I do. So I'm like, all right, I got a free hour. What do I do? Okay, let's write, write something in the new email newsletter, something like that. Um, I've got a free one. I'm going to go to the coffee shop and write, write some blog posts. There you go. There you go. <laughs> we'll write a blog post together. Um, I'll be, that's what I'll be doing an email newsletter this afternoon. So um, people can find your website at waterloggedlife.com. Um, they can follow the work that you do on Facebook. They can also follow you. Um, I tend to see you a lot on Instagram. That's where I look for you. Um, on Instagram and um, yeah I just wanted to show this photo because this is a photo um, where is this on your Facebook page yep this is uh, my waterlogged I guess it's my logo um, I actually took that photo at Aquarium in the Pacific and then you know put some words in front of it but I think jellyfish are pretty cool yep I oh I do too I think they're cool too and, you know, when I first started college, I was uh, entered into journalism, and then I switched my major to marine biology. I don't know if anybody knows that. I switched my major oh. to marine biology, and then I was just like, 
I'm not going to school more than four years. So I switched again because <laughs> I noticed there wasn't much I could do with the bachelor's. Um, but yeah. Okay. So we're getting a lot of comments of people saying this was very fascinating. Um, yeah, I just wanted to I'll wrap up by saying, um, you know, this, I don't want to say this in specific, but, um, Maybe we live stream some of this in level one or level two about if you want some of the work you're doing with um, Frank. Yeah. Changing the behavior. Um, so, yeah, um, if you want to learn more about what we do here at the Animal Behavior Center, um, all, we teach people through online learning with live streams, Q&As, interviews with professionals. We do this in our level one and level two program. Level one is geared primarily towards people with companion animals. Level two are people that want to get into the field or want more intense um, information, education. Um, we have our species-specific projects. You can find all about what we do on our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Don't forget to join us next week at 5 p.m. on Saturday. It will be cocktails with critters versus coffee with critters on Sunday. Um, with Dr. Jason Cran and special guests. Um, in two weeks from now, we will be live. Well, I'll be at um, speaking at this C4AW event in Chicago, um, St. Charles, just outside Chicago, C4AW.org. Registration, you can still register, but you must register to attend. <clears throat> Pay attention to our website. Um, we Next year is going to be full of workshops. We just scheduled two dates for these two workshops, they will be available to our members first. Um, they will sell out, I have no doubt. And once um, we, after we've subjected them to the members, we will post them to the public if there are seats available. Don't forget about our referral program. For every five people you refer to us that join our memberships or projects, earns you a one hour, hour consultation for you individually or the organization you work for. And with that being said, I thank you, everybody, for joining another episode of Coffee with the Critters. Hillary, you're getting a lot of comments, compliments, um, and people saying this is the best Coffee with the Critters ever. <laughs> so <clears throat> thank, thank you, everybody, for joining. And um, you can follow Hillary and the work that she's doing um, on the links that I provided. So we'll see you next week. And Hillary, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was a fun time. <laughs>